This is episode 111 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm speaking with Karen Gross. Karen is an educator, author, and artist, a former professor, college president, and senior policy advisor to the U.S. Department of Education. She currently teaches at Rutgers School of Social Work. She specializes in trauma and its impact on individuals and organizations with an emphasis on student success and leadership in the time of crisis. She writes a children's book series titled Lady Lucy's Quest that is trauma-sensitive. To date, she has read to more than 3,500 children across the globe. In the interview, Karen discusses her newest book in the series, Lady Lucy's Morgan Horse Quest. It's a story that inspires us all to believe in each other and the power of the possible. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm so excited to have Karen Groves on the show with me. Hi, Karen. Welcome. Hi. Nice to see you, Carly. Nice to be with you and your audience. I'm so excited to have you, and Karen has an amazing background and resume, which we'll dive a little bit into in the interview, and she's dressed the part today. Uh, for those of you watching us on YouTube, you can see that she is wearing a horse scarf, horse earrings horse necklace and oh, a horse and bracelet in a horse ring. <laughs> she is horsey. <Yes. laughs> All the way horsey, my kind of gal. So for listeners who are just uh, tuning in or, or people who've been listening for a while, I'd love to start off these conversations, Karen, is learning a little bit more about how horses have touched your life. Would you share? Sure, absolutely. I know that for many people, owning a horse and riding a horse has been their way of connecting with the equestrian community. My way is a little bit different, um, but equally powerful, I think, in many ways. For me, I have always admired how horses look and move and generate energy. And so the power of horses has been something that's been with me ever since I've been a little girl. And so for me to write a children slash adult book about horses is an opportunity to capture, I hope, the joy that horses can bring to people, whether you ride them or not. Absolutely. And I, I'm sure you were very much like I was when I was little, as I was wanting to grab all those books about horses, and now you're writing them. How exciting is that? Oh, and there's the briar. <laughs> So, you know, I, I have lots of things related to horses, many of which I share when I read the book so that people can see that my interest and the meaning of the book is more than just the story, um, as is true with many books. I love that. That is perfect. Now, I am very excited to have you on the show today because you have an impressive resume. You're doing amazing work. I, I, you know, I'm going to list this off for a second. Bear with me. But you're an author, an educator, obviously a storyteller. But you have served as a senior policy advisor to the U.S. Department of Education. And prior to that, you were a law professor for two decades, focusing on asset building in low-income communities. And you also are an expert in trauma and disaster planning and relief and teach in a clinical certification program in trauma at Rutgers Graduate School of Social Work. Wow, you are doing amazing things. Can you talk to us about why you chose this line of work or this path and what it was like working in those spaces? It's just incredible to me. Sure. So I'm an educator by training and actually... One of the things that happened is that in the years that I was a college president and when I worked with the Department of Education, I saw that if you really want to make an impact on the lives of children, 
What you have to do is literally back up the education train. Mm. And as important as the work was that I did with older students and adults, some of which I still do, if you really wanna change education, you have to start early and often. And so I started writing children's books. And what I noticed as I went to many schools and read to thousands of children is that many children, this is pre-pandemic, were experiencing trauma, which was affecting not only their learning, but their psychosocial development. And then I would go to disaster sites like school shootings, sadly, and concert shootings and immigration sites to help children deal with the trauma they had and try to move forward because trauma never goes away. Mm -hmm. And then along came the pandemic and not just the pandemic, but racial and ethnic tensions and violence and shootings and natural disasters and death and illness. And so the work I used to travel to do, I could now do in communities near to me and farther away and across the globe that needed help mm. as we navigate forward in these difficult and trying times. My goodness. And in all those things you touched on, I mean, trauma is the the root of that. What what would you say to listeners today that are listening and and trying to be with their children through this situation, just being there for them. And do you have any words of wisdom or, or nuggets of information that you could possibly share? So I would share two things with you. The first is that behavior is the language of trauma. Hmm. So when young people act out or young people isolate themselves or young people are too clingy, all of that can be trauma symptomology. So it's not like young people or even adults are intending to do things that are out of the ordinary as we used to know them. It's that trauma impacts your behavior, your thoughts, and your emotions. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would add is that while trauma can never go away, there are ways to ameliorate it, to help its symptomology tamp down. And one of the ways is by looking at, touching, talking about, and reading about animals. Mm -hmm. And so all of my children's books, including the most recent one, which we're talking about today, feature animals because people can relate to them. It allows them to be more creative, to use their senses, to exercise their neural pathways, all of which help deal with trauma. I love that. And animal, animals are so special. And as people who love horses, obviously, and dogs and cats and the whole gamut, there's this, this calming effect and this communicative experience that you have when you're with an animal where language, speaking out loud, is removed from the equation. And it's more about energy and uh, nonverbal communication with those animals. Would you say that's a big part of why they they calm down besides the fact that they're really soft, right? <laughs> well, I also think there's emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And I think it's often easier for people who are experiencing trauma to connect with an animal, mm -hmm. whether up close or further away. I mean, there is a reason that there have been so many pandemic puppies. I just read a book called West with Giraffes which is about relating to giraffes. And it's an amazing story about giraffes moving across the United States in the late 1930s to giraffes. Mm -hmm. And I also think any animal, whether it's a stuffed animal or a real animal, provides a connection. And the reason that matters is that trauma literally shuts down connection. Our brains are wired for connection, literally wired, has neural pathways that are designed to connect us with others. And then along comes trauma, including through the pandemic and masks and social distancing. And animals help us open new neural pathways and reconnect. How important is that? Oh, so important. And I love that you mentioned that your children's book series includes animals uh, based on this whole conversation we just talked about. Tell us about the Lady Lucy children's book series and 
you know, you just talked a little bit about what inspired you to write the books, but talk to us a little bit about where this idea came from. So the, the very first story, Lady Lucy's Quest, is about a young girl who wants to be a knight in the Middle Ages, and she's told, no, 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 girls can't be knights. And she goes ahead and proceeds to take the tests of knighthood and succeeds. And that book is really about the power of the possible mm -hmm. and overcoming obstacles and overcoming people who don't agree with you and don't support you, which is true, by the way, for many, many children. Mm -hmm. And so that book is an entree into a whole set of quests where Lady Lucy builds a team that starts with Dylan the dinosaur and moves to Tapestry the unicorn and Quincy the Belgian sheepdog and now Morgan the horse. And so Morgan will now be part of the next quest because he'll be part of the team that goes forward to help Lady Lucy solve a myriad of problems that are confronting her and her community and that she can solve with this team that involves animals of all sorts. Oh, I love that. And how many books so far are in the, the Lady Lucy series? Well, it depends if you count in English and in other languages. Ah. Ah, so, and it depends if you count activity books and it depends if you count the <laughs> prequel, but on balance, it's easiest to say there are seven Lady Lucy books in the series so far with more to come. And I should add that the original name, Lady Lucy, is based on a real woman, Lady yes. Lucy Duff Gordon, who was a very well-known fashion designer in both the United States and in Great Britain, who was never truly recognized for the talent she had. And in many ways, people don't even know about her or remember her or talk about her. And by the way, she was also on the Titanic and survived. And so in a sense, this book is a tribute to her so that people can remember an amazing woman that time and history forgot. Oh, that is so wonderful. And isn't that a beautiful thing about being an author is we can retell stories that have been forgotten and pay tribute to people who have inspired us and then have their stories inspire others. So this is a uh, historical fiction-ish character that wound up building a team in your books. <laughs> it's interesting that you raise that because I tell people when you think about writing children's books that you have the actual story, the bottom line story, but then there's lots of other things going on in a story that's constructed like a layer cake. Mm -hmm. There's a historical piece. Then there's a piece about ideas and themes and values that matter. And then there's something about context and when a book correlates to what's happening in the current world. So you can read books as a layer cake and actually. Lady Lucy's Morgan Horse Quest is designed to allow for it to be read at many of the layers within a reading layer cake. Wow, that is really wonderful and so, so true. And, and I like that you mentioned that you have accompanying activities and questions and pieces on the Lady Lucy website that go along with the books. Did you want to mention a little bit about some of the things that are available for listeners who, who choose to, I feel like adults and children should be reading, <laughs> reading this book. <laughs> well, let, let me share them as they relate to the Morgan Horse book. Okay. Since that may interest your particular audience more. Mm -hmm. So there's a wonderful story in the book about Lady Lucy trying to help her community overcome a horrible winter where everybody stayed inside and everything was frozen and schools didn't happen. And if you just happen to think about the pandemic, yes, there are similarities, although it doesn't have all the features of the pandemic. So you can read the actual story, but 
The Morgan horse is actually the state animal of Vermont. And all of our states have animals, state animals. And we often don't even know what's the state animal in the state in which we live. And so just helping kids and adults focus on, so what's the state animal where I am? Not every state has a Morgan horse, but the Morgan horse is the state animal of Vermont. And then if you go deeper, there's a reason for that. There was a young man named Justin Morgan who got some horses as a payoff for a debt that he was owed. And there then is a children's book and a movie called Justin Morgan Has a Horse. And there's a Morgan horse farm at the University of Vermont. And there are various ways that Morgan horses have been recognized in that state. So there's lots to learn, not only about horses in general, but the Morgan horse, the Morgan horse in Vermont, its history, its development. And so the book is designed to allow you to do that kind of work, but it also allows you to draw horses or to paint horses. And for many people, you can then use art as a way of thinking about horses. And actually for me, one of the most interesting things to do with young people is not only to draw realistic horses or the head of a horse, but also to learn to do more abstract horses. So you can do cubist type horses where you use shapes. You can do pointillism, which is like dots to make horses. So while one can do amazing horses that look like this, one can also do horses that are more abstract, which allows your creative thinking to work and function. And then the book tells the story about problem solving, which is something we're all trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about how they solve their problem in this book, it allows you to think about problem solving more generally. And actually more recently, people have said that this book should be used in leadership courses because the way it describes how Lady Lucy leads her team of Dylan and Tapestry and Quincy and now Morgan. It's something that can be replicated in the workplace. And and I was that was part of the question I was gonna ask you, how is this book being used? Because you are an, are an educator. So you just mentioned leadership courses. Talk a little bit about how you're taking this book and the rest of the series in, into the world. How are you reaching your readers? How, how is it being used? So it's being used in a variety of ways. So it's surely being used in classrooms. And I often now on Zoom will read to students. Mm -hmm. And so they hear the story and they see the story up on the screen. And then we can do a drawing exercise or we could do a horse dance or we could look at horse songs, songs that people have written about horses, which are by the way, plentiful. <laughs> um, so that's one one area and one way in which the book is getting used. I have also used the book because I teach on how to write children's books and illustrate them. So I have used the book for that as an example. And I have also taught about how to read to children in an animated way so that they engage. And I've used Lady Lucy's Morgan Horse Quest for that. And most recently, well, actually not most, second to most recently, there were some Morgan horses in Vermont, seven of them, who were very badly injured. I reached out to the Dorset Equine Rescue and I said, I've written a book about Morgan horses and maybe it would be something that could help you as you're trying to rescue these seven Morgan horses. So they said, oh, that would be great. I sent them 20 books. And they have given about half of them to their donors, their big donors who have given money to save the Morgan horses. They're selling some of them, but also they're auctioning them off and auctioning me with it to read one of the books to a family or a class or a child as part of their auction. So 
for me, it serves many purposes. It's a way I can help others with others being defined very broadly. Oh, I love that. And you're doing, doing so much good with this book series and this book in particular, helping the Morgan horses and being auctioned off. And I would love to have you read a, read a story to me. You have a lovely, lovely voice. <laughs> I can only imagine. I would be happy to read you a story. And if, we, if you want, I'm happy to read even the beginning of this book on this podcast so people can hear it. I, I don't know that. if you've ever done that, but I'm happy to read the beginning if that would be of interest. I think we should do that. Why don't we do that at the end of the interview to give people something to look forward to? And I think people would enjoy that very much. And what I'm hearing is you are having a blast. Like I can hear the joy in your voice through your creative writing experiences, even though you're touching on some, I don't know, tra trauma, right? People sometimes think, oh my goodness, that's heavy, but you're making light and giving it a learning lesson and sh showing children how to build teams and your whole stories are, are based in possibility and you're doing good for animals. I mean, you're, I can just hear the fun that you're having with this story. I wanted to mention too, for listeners, you also write books for adults on some of uh, some of the topics that that are in your background. Do you want to mention those quickly? The children's book series is really, as you describe it, an opportunity for amazing joy and mm -hmm. pleasure and to restore fun into the lives of children, particularly those who've been traumatized. And the books are all trauma sensitive and they appear on lists of trauma sensitive books for kids. Mm -hmm. And the word trauma doesn't show up in the books, but it tries to restore what trauma takes away. So it builds back self-esteem. It allows for connection and interaction and engagement. And trauma takes away our joy and our humor and fun. And so it restores that. Mm -hmm. But I also write serious academic books, the two most recent of which were published by Teachers College Press. I've written a book called Breakaway Learners, and then I call it the next one. It's side quill, not sea quill. They sit <laughs> side by side. It's side quill, which is called Trauma Doesn't Stop at the School Door. Mm. And that's a book that has been very popular during the pandemic because it addresses quite directly the trauma that we carry in an invisible backpack. Mm that we often don't know we're carrying and it grows and grows. And so how to think about trauma and how to ameliorate it and then how to recognize its importance and some strategies to do all that in real life is what the adult books are about. Mm -hmm. So I have an architecture for thinking about it. You have to name it so you can tame it and then you can frame it as in put it in a frame to recognize its importance, but also frame it as in like a frame of a house to create an architecture for thinking about it. How did you become, because, you know, it says all books that are written are partly personal, right? They're, I mean, where do you pull your frame of reference from? It's, it's your own life, right? So, so how, did, how did trauma enter, the, the inter interest in studying trauma enter your your world like where did that sort of inspiration to expand on that topic into your life i've learned about trauma by working with students at all ages and stages mm -hmm. and i have developed an understanding of it through the science and the literature that has accompanied it mm -hmm. but as i always disclose both in what i write and when i speak I myself have experienced trauma as a child and as an adult, and that has informed the work I do and the comfort that I feel both in talking about it and writing about it and sharing about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to talk about being traumatized. No one asks to be traumatized, but it has informed what I do. And so as much as the academic part matters and as much as the work matters that I do with students and businesses and educators and organizations, it's also my personal experience mm. that informs my work. 
That's really powerful to to take something that occurred and expand it and make a difference in other people's lives. I really commend you for that. And thank you for sharing that. I know it could have been kind of a, a sensitive spot to go to. So I appreciate you answering that question. Now on the brighter, the brighter side, I mean, it's all bright because we're, we're working through it and helping other people and you're sharing your knowledge with others. And you already mentioned when you're writing your children's book, there's these, these layers, like a layer cake. I, I was curious, like, so how do you approach writing a children's book? Because it's very different from writing a novel or writing a, you know, research-based nonfiction book. How do you approach it? Do you start with like a message you want to deliver and, and I'm so curious how you come up with your, your characters for the team, for Lucy's team. So this answer will probably surprise you. First of all, I always write standing up. And I write in a space that I can't quite explain, except that the stories just come out. Mm. And while many people may have outlines or ideas that guide them through the writing process, I actually am inspired to write when I'm in this creative space and a story just literally comes out. <laughs> now, I obviously do research. <laughs> I learned a lot about state animals and Morgan horses, and I know about knights, and I know about the tests of knighthood. I do do that, but the stories just come. They do share certain features. Mm -hmm. Lady Lucy and her team always go to a library to do research and to find out more. And Dylan can never fit in because he's too big because he's a dragon. So he always like sticks his head through the window. <laughs> and now Morgan is doing the same because Morgan can't fit through the door either. And so there's always that. Usually there are three tries at the quest, the first two of which aren't successful, mm -hmm. and the third of which is. It's actually a sort of standard literary trope to do that. So there are some parameters to my thinking, mm -hmm. but basically it just literally comes to me mm -hmm. as I stand and write. I love that feeling. I'm so glad that you 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 have that. I mean, so it, sometimes it's just like poof, and then you're like, "Whoa, I got to get this down." I think that's like the ultimate flow state. Have you you? I'm sure you have well, read about yes, flow. Athletes call it being in the zone, mm -hmm. and and athletes often actually can't remember the whole athletic event that happened when they're in the zone. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that. Some of what I've written, I later read, and I'm reading it as if someone else wrote it because I write it in some different space. And I go, oh, wow, oh, hmm, that's interesting, or <laughs> that's insightful, or I really like that children's story. Where so, did that come from? Yeah, right, I don't is... want you to think I have a split personality. It's <laughs> just I have a creative space mm -hmm. where I write. Yeah, I absolutely don't think you have a split personality. I think a lot of authors, a lot of writers, a lot of creatives have that experience of time passing quickly. I know I do. And then going back and reading what you wrote and going, whoa. Where'd that come from? That's actually pretty good. Like, so I, I feel like you, you are actually in the zone. You're in the flow when you have those experiences. And I feel like I, I personally think that's the best feeling in the world. That it means you're, you're right where you're supposed to be. Now let's talk a little bit about the illustrations in your book. I think I, talk to us about how you, how you found your illustrators and, and that process of the book. The first lady Lucy book, the second and the prequel were actually illustrated by originally two Korean students who were high school students who did it as their senior project. And then they did it in their first few years of college and it actually provided them with some money to help them find their way through college. So the original Lady Lucy book and the original Lady Lucy in it and the original drawings of Dylan the Dragon and Tapestry were done by these students. Mm -hmm. When they moved on, I found an illustrator who's a teacher of art in the United Kingdom. And she has illustrated with her students oh. and graduates of her art school, the art that appears in the more recent Lady Lucy books. 
And she is amazing, but we still retain the idea that students inform the work, think about the work, see the work, add to the work. And so I like to say that I have students or art teachers who are doing all the art. Wow. I mean, talk about giving. I mean, th this project is just giving, giving, giving. I love that you've tapped into the creativity of art students and art teachers. So how does that work? I think I, I saw that on your website when I was galloping around doing research for the questions. And I just thought that was so neat that you were working with, with students to illustrate your books. How, how does that work? What does someone need to know when they're writing a children's book about working with illustrators, especially in your, in your case, because it's a whole bunch of different people. <laughs> so you have to be literally on the same page mm. in terms of how you see the story and see the characters and see the value. And interestingly, almost everyone who has read the stories when they have had no illustrations have found the parts that I would have illustrated if I had picked the parts myself. Mm. And so I actually let the illustrators sort of find the spots in the story where they want to draw. For me, if you give illustrators some opportunity and freedom to take the story and make it their own, the illustrations are vastly more powerful than if I said, draw a horse here and draw a village there and draw this there. Mm -hmm. um, it's way easier if they exercise their creativity. And then I might say, well, wait a minute. I, I, I think this doesn't quite get at it. Can you think about this? So it's collaborative. You, you, you're, you give them the freedom to use their creativity and the parts of the book that they really want to draw because I think wanting to draw something probably provides a better picture, but then you review it and you collaborate and you talk and then it, it becomes this, this beautiful collection of illustrations. Yes, it's absolutely collaborative. In a sense, while I could illustrate some of them, I think it's better to have someone else do it because it allows for a richer book. It adds perspective to it. So I'm, thrilled by the illustrations. I look at them with joy and pleasure and they make the story come alive in a myriad of ways. So that's, I feel very good about the illustrations. Yeah, that's gotta be an amazing experience to see someone bring your words to a visual. I can't mm -hmm. imagine how exciting that probably feels. And then, so how do you work with, do you, do you buy the illustrations from the students, do you offer them a little bit of the royalties from the book? How, do, do, you, do you own the copyright? So it has depended. Um, I've done it very differently mm -hmm. um, in different contexts. So the students, I actually, when they did it as a project for school, I didn't pay them. Well, actually, I did pay them an honorarium, but that, that was part of their senior project at school. They used it to do an art exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, we had an an event at their school where I read the book and they shared the stories of how they illustrated it. And then in addition to giving them books, there were Lady Lucy dolls that were made. There were 10 of them and they each got a Lady Lucy doll. Um, and sadly, I don't have any left and I don't have one. So I'm rethinking whether it's time to get more Lady Lucy dolls. The illustrator that I use now does the work as part of a, an art institute that she runs and a foundation. So part of the work is supported by the foundation and part of the proceeds go to support the restoration of a church in England in the county of Surrey, which is where the books take place in England. Um, <laughs> And some of the books have been sponsored by organizations that have then paid and then I pay others in turn to illustrate and design them. So it's dependent on the book. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it, every time you share something new, there's another little golden nugget of giving back that your books are providing. I just think that that is so beautiful. Now, how did you approach publishing with this? Did you go the independent route or you did it yourself or did you approach a traditional publisher to get your books out there? The so it's interesting. Books. I actually just gave a lecture on how to write and illustrate and 
design and publish and promote and market and get prizes for the books that you write. So can um, I take that this, course? <laughs> this is a topic of, of considerable interest because actually mm -hmm. I think we all have a children's book in us somewhere. Mm -hmm. We just don't know how to get it out. I, I've used all kinds of publishers over the years. I, I have never self-published. Mm. I've used an independent press, which is different than other kinds of presses because they have an arm that promotes the books. Mm -hmm. The press I used, which is the imprint still remains, but the press no longer does. But mm. they ran two very wonderful bookstores. And so we would do promotional events at the bookstores. They would sell the books, they would promote the books, and then they would be sold through Ingram. So that's one way. In England, I've used a British publisher and they've been distributed in England through different channels, including at places that the are suited to the book. So there's a book on finding a dinosaur and it's going to be sold through the museum that houses the dinosaur bones. Um, so I've used a British publisher simultaneously with a U.S. publisher. Um, I've also used um, for different books with different textures. So I have a book made of indestructible paper for really little kids. So you can spit on the book or <laughs> Chew the corner. Um, write on the book or chew <laughs> on the book. It's the sort of contemporary equivalent to cloth books. And I had that printed off site because they had the kind of paper that I wanted for that. So I, I've used different publishers. Now I use an academic press for my adult books, although I've done some academic writing of chapters and things that have been more mainstream press. Um, mm -hmm. So I've used every form of publishing that there is I think. <laughs> so that's amazing so then so then you can order quantity from these small presses that you want to so you have you have them there but then they go through ingram so they can be distributed elsewhere and, and they're it, also sold through amazon yeah um and barnes and nobles and if you want to one of my books it's really not hard to find them you can just google them and get them yes um and you've done a, a great job, but it, I think you're speaking to a lot of the things about being an author is it's sort of like, I'm going to try this, and then I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to listen to others, and I'm going to ask questions, and then I'm going to go this route, and then if that doesn't work, I'll try this. You know, there's a lot of option to, to getting a book out into the world, and it sounds like this is going very well for you. So it's... Well, it, it's actually a very... <laughs> The writing and the illustrating and the designing and the publishing are one piece, mm -hmm. well, four pieces, <laughs> but the marketing and promoting and sale of books and their winning prizes and the like is a whole other skill set. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it's way harder to do that part of it than the part involving writing and illustrating and designing and publishing. It's interesting for me because, I mean, unless you have an in, immensely famous person writing a children's book or one of the classic children's books, whether it's Make Way for Ducklings or Eloise or Goodnight Moon or something, most of these books don't generate in and of themselves enough to support an author, mm -hmm. if that's what you're looking to do for your livelihood. I remember my first royalty check, my <laughs> first adult book, and I looked at it and um, I, I looked, I thought maybe they forgot a zero or something in there. But I remember looking at it and thinking, oh my goodness, this, this is, you know, not, not, you know, going to enable me on its own mm -hmm. to thrive. Um, so. <laughs> and, and that is true. I mean, we have to sell an awful lot of books or have a lot of books in our backlist to make a living at being an author, unless, unless something magic happens and your single novel takes off, but that's an unlikely story. And, and I think you're doing the right thing with the children's, children's book is creating a series that stays true to the purpose and follows her on her quest and continues, right? Because that that is more, I've found in talking to other authors, 
marketing is definitely the hardest part, but also writing a series and building your backlist is a way to make it sustainable, right? Does that well, make sense? It also, I mean, to be fair, I'm not, I mean, I've earned every gray hair. And so <laughs> for me, it's also a chance to give back. Mm -hmm. So my books can serve, I hope, to enrich the lives of many, many children who need books, who want books, who don't have books. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent I can also do that, that matters to me a lot. Mm -hmm. So while it's not a completely illamasonary effort, I do give away a sizable number of books in addition to those that I sell. Mm -hmm. And the the richness comes from the creative endeavor and creating and in giving back. Like, you know, I feel like a lot of writers, we don't write, oh, it'd be nice to make some money, but like, that's not the reason why we're writing these stories. We're writing for that flow experience. We're writing to bring joy to other people through our stories. We're writing to give back to our communities. Like all the things that you're doing, like there, that's to me is the richness, the richness in having done a written a book, right? Like that's a massive undertaking. And I don't, think most of us write for the money. I think we write for the contribution, for the feeling, for the experience, for the flow. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would. I mean, now having said that, writing is also what enables me to make money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what enables me to be hired to speak to groups. Mm -hmm. it, what, it is what allows me to talk about trauma and use examples that I have from books I've written. Mm -hmm. um, it's what allows me to consult with schools that are experiencing horrific things that are happening there. So I earn my living actually not from the books per se, but from the opportunities the books create to give back. A hundred percent. Best calling card is having written a, written a book on your topic of expertise. So it it pay it pays back in different ways. I think yes, you know. I it think. doesn't pay back directly by the mm -hmm. sale of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I think a, a lot of people don't understand that. Like for every book we sell, we make what like two dollars if if we're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it take, takes a lot of books or, or having written a lot of books, but, but there are other opportunities that do come about because you have written a book. And so it gives back in that way too. Now you've written a lot of books. Uh, for, I love to ask these questions because everybody has a little bit different perspective on this, but for you, what is the very best part about being an author? And I think I kind of already know the answer to this, but I wanted to give you brains and then uh, on the flip side, what is the difficult part of being an author? Uh, I'd say the best part is being able to share ideas and thoughts that I have that can improve the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And whether that's in my adult books or my children's books, I hope that I'm doing something that enables people to become their best selves and that the book will help them with that. I think the I, I don't know that there's a hardest part for me. I mean, it's been mostly a joy. But if I were to talk about the, the hardest part, it's to recognize the number of people who struggle to get books, who struggle to read, who've never really experienced the joy that comes from words. Mm -hmm. And so one of the hardest parts for me is to recognize that that's not a, a small group. That's actually a, a pretty large group. And, and so my writing doesn't get to them or doesn't help them. So there's a part of all of this that involves what you might call preaching to the choir, right? I mean, people who read books, read my books and enjoy them and they flourish and the kids flourish. But the hard part is they're not always getting to the teachers or the kids who really need them. Mm. That for me is difficult. Oh, there's so much truth in that. So I, I'm really excited to have you read like the first chapter of uh, the book. But first, I wanted to ask you, what are you curious about? What's next for you? I think you mentioned there's another Lady Lucy book coming, but what is what are you thinking? Are you want to make this into a TV cartoon series? You want to, you know, where are you going? 
<laughs> there, there is, there are actually several Lady Lucy books in the pipeline at varying mm -hmm. stages. So there will be more Lady Lucy books. And I actually want to put them together as a set oh. so that kids and families can sort of follow her and see it as a sequence and pull the books off a shelf and remember her various quests. I'm also looking at other ways that the books can be accompanied by items or stuffed animals or Lady Lucy dolls or activity sets because the reading as I described is just one part of it. Mm -hmm. And so I've been sort of wrestling with how to make that happen. I mean, it certainly happens when I bring them into a classroom because I hand things out or we make horses out of pipe cleaners <laughs> or draw giraffes if we're doing that. So I'm trying to figure out how to make the books animate themselves if I'm not there to do mm -hmm. it with them. I love that. That is so great. So big, big things in the pipeline coming. And I think a box that is a terrific idea. I mean, those are the the kind of things that kids grow up with and they remember. And then when they're all together, that's beautiful. Now, I'm so excited to have you read the first chapter and give us a little taste of, do you have a, a horse hat you can put on right I do. now? I do. <laughs> well, then let's go for the whole whole shebang. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're fine here. Okay. <laughs> um, the horse hat is really good with kids. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with it yet. Well, you're you already dressed the part too. <laughs> no pressure. You've got your your horse your horse scarf and garb on, so you're you're perfect. So I'll give you the reins. All right. So for those who haven't seen it, th this is the book cover, which is really I think quite beautiful, and the back cover um, is equally tender. Oh, it's a um, little girl kissing the the Morgan on the nose. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Let's just start and then we'll stop when there's just the right point that you want to continue on your own. <laughs> Perfect. Lady Lucy, Dylan the Dragon, Tapestry the Unicorn, and Quincy the Belgian Shepherd were together after one of their most successful quests, finding the skeleton of a fish-eating dinosaur. <laughs> They had enjoyed the thrill of discovering dinosaur bones, but they liked being together after a long winter. And just so you can see, there are illustrations of all of these people here like little portraits. <laughs> Peace reigned in the kingdom. Suddenly, their quiet time was disrupted by Squire Sanders. He pulled a large scroll from his saddlebag. Squire Sanders was a quiet type of person, but on this day, he was dancing. He could barely keep himself from doing twirls around Lady Lucy's yard. I should just pause for a minute. So there are intentional linguistic things in here, like alliteration, mm. which you're probably picking up, like Squire Sanders and scroll and saddlebag and Lady Lucy. I mean, so there's a rhythm that these books have if you read them. So here's what the scroll said. <laughs> Lady Lucy and your team members, I need your help yet again. We have had a long, hard winter. Many homes did not have enough heat for the cold weather. The earth has been frozen solid, that it is making it hard to plant and plow. Many children disliked being stuck in their homes because it was too cold to play outdoors with their friends. Some schools were shut down for weeks on end. We need something that will lift everyone's spirits, that will bring smiles to families, I am sure you and your team can invent something. I'm happy to provide you with the supplies you need. And as a sign of my trust in you, I am giving you my amazing horse, Morgan. 
faithfully yours, Sir Winston, the oldest and wisest knight in the kingdom. After reading these words from Sir Winston, Squire Sanders kicked his heels together, leaving Lady Lucy and her friends to ponder what they had just read. Dylan the dragon was worried. Did I hear that right, Dylan said? A horse is arriving here tomorrow? Where will he live? What will he do all day? Is he bigger than me? I bet he'll eat my food. Tapestry, the unicorn, was worried too. A horse is arriving here tomorrow, she repeated. Then she added, he will dislike my bright colors and my single horn and he will tease me. Quincy, the Belgian shepherd, suddenly ran around the lawn in repeated circles and then dug a huge hole and he thought the horse would take his bones. <laughs> Lady Lucy looked at her team. She wasn't worried about the horse. She was worried about creating an event that would make the whole town happy. Let's not judge so quickly, she said calmly. Let's welcome Morgan and not worry about where he will eat and sleep and what he will do all day. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for that treat. That was so wonderful. And it's these are wonderful stories and I'm so excited and I'm so glad you shared a little tidbit there. I will be sure to link to where people can find you and your books in the show notes, but can you let listeners know where they can find out more about you and your lovely books? Sure. I, I have a website, which is www.karengrowseducation.com. And you can also get the books from Amazon. You can get the books from any bookstore. And if they don't have it in stock, they can get it. And the Lady Lucy series, I hope, will bring your listeners joy and pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for your time today, Karen. I really, really appreciate you being on the show and sharing about your lovely books and sharing about your background. And thank you for the amazing work you're doing in, in the world and in our community. Well, it's been wonderful being with you, Carly. So I hope we can maybe do it again. Thank you so much for having me to your listeners. I, I hope these books bring you joy. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author, who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle. <laughs>